North Bennett Street School. My name is Sarah Turner. I'm the president at North Bennett, and I'm standing here in the violin making program, which will be one of two tours today. We'll be visiting the violin making program and also the jewelry making program. The person on the other side of this camera is Rob O'Dwyer, our director of enrollment and admissions. And Rob, along with students and faculty, will be your hosts today. Um, Rob will talk with students. He'll show you projects. You'll learn a little bit about the curriculum of our full-time programs. And behind the scenes is a, a team of people so that if you have questions during the visit and you want to put them in the chat, you can do that. And you'll see that your questions can get answered at the same time. So we just hope it's a great visit. We hope you learn a lot about what it is to study at the school. And even if you know you're interested in violin, I encourage you to stay for jewelry. You can look at the recordings from the past days. You might be surprised to find out that really you're, you should be a preservation carpenter. Who knows? So um, enjoy your visit. I'm going to introduce Nathan Abbey, who is going to um, really be another guide to the violin program. Nathan is a graduate of the violin program and also one of our teaching assistants. So with that, I will turn it to Nate and to Rob and have a great day. Sarah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Have fun. Thanks, Sarah. Hey, everyone. Uh, and on that note, uh, I think Sarah said something so wonderful just then about um, really getting to know the programs ahead of time and understanding um, yourself and what you can get out of them. I myself was interested in preservation carpentry at first and uh, in researching the different programs found that um, violin making was more uh, suitable to how I like to work, things I like to work on and the environment in which I like to work. So uh, I'd suggest keeping an open mind and really letting, um, uh, let yourself explore the various offerings from the school and and keep an open mind to it. And uh, now I'm in violin and went through the program. I'm the teaching assistant now. And um, I love being around here because the facilities are wonderful to work in. Uh, as you can see behind me, uh, we have each student gets a bench and um, will move benches through their time in the program. And uh, it provides a great dedicated space to um, improve your skills and make the required seven instruments that you need to graduate. Um, one of the most important things in our program, which is the beginning of the curriculum is sharpening, uh, which is right next to me here. Our sharpening station is a dedicated space for us to really dial in um, the tools and make sure they're set up properly as well as uh, as sharp as possible. And uh, most of our work is without a mallet. Uh, so it's mostly uh, hand carving and uh, we need very sharp tools in order to do that. Uh, we have Daniel here who's sharpening up. What you got there, Daniel? I have a block plane. Block plane. So block plane is one of our most used tools and uh, needs to get sharpened occasionally. So Daniel's doing that. Um, typically as a first year student, a uh, uh, majority of the first week or two is spent sharpening, setting up your tools and making sure that they're ready to use on the instrument. Uh, Daniel, what was it like for you as a first year? Uh, it was challenging for sure. Yeah. It was, it was a, lot of, a lot of hard work, a lot of um, testing my, my, myself and to see how, how hard I can work and how long I can last. And it was very rewarding, very rewarding. What was maybe one of the biggest lessons you learned from sharpening? To be patient, patience, patience. Um, yeah. it, it takes a long time uh, to get to where you need to be, especially not only with the block plane, but with all of your tools. It's going to take time. It's going to take some some practice, and it's not going to be perfect the first time. And so that's probably the best lesson that I've learned out of out of all. What's your favorite thing to start with? Probably this, probably this. It's it's the it's the easiest to, to sharpen. It's very uh, simple. It's very easy to, to see. The lines are pretty. It's it gets sharpened nice and polished and it's perfect. 
Do you want to talk about our sharpening system a little bit? Yeah, so um, we've got um, two different sets of stones here. Um, we have Shaptons and then we have Nanahones. Um, the Shaptons go all the way up to 30,000, uh, starting at 500. And then the, the Nanahones go from uh, 200 all the way up to 10,000. Um, the reason that we have two different uh, types of stones here is because we use them differently. So the nanohones, usually you use them on like your chisels and your gouges. They're a little bit softer than the shaftons. Um, and then for the shaftons, you usually use them for like, say your block plane or your knives. Um, and uh, we have these holders here that um, hold the stone on here so that you can have a nice firm from grip on that so it doesn't move anywhere. Uh, and then we have the lapping stones. And uh, what you do is I'll show you, is that it's dirty here because I am sharpening. And you put the lapping stone on here. And you it back and forth. And what this is doing is it's flattening the stone. It's re-flattening the stone. So, and that's about it. That's great. If you just give me a second, speaking of patience, I did test this earlier uh, on my camera, but now that we're on Zoom, I can see I have a little bit of my, my camera gimbal is sticking into the frame. And I just wanna fix that real quick. Get that out of there. I feel like Bob Ross. We'll just get that out of there. And <clears throat> cool. Now, Daniel mentioned that we have stones that go up to a 30,000 grit. Um, and if you have any experience with sharpening tools already, you'll know that it's a, a pretty ridiculous grit to work with. Uh, and many might suggest that it's useless. But, okay. Um, we're not relying on any sort of uh, stropping mechanisms or honing tools. Uh, we're honing on the stone itself and relying on creating a very flat, um, very reliable uh, hollow grind surface um, that gets maintained up through all of the grits. And 30,000 uh, is a great way to hone a, uh, like a, a flat tool, like a chisel or um, a bench plane, block plane. And um, the 30,000 we find, it really gives it that extra um, ability to last very long time. You can use it for quite a while and it'll maintain that, that nice crisp edge. Um, I think that's about it for sharpening. Uh, I, maybe we can move over to one of the students bench and so yeah, it'll be great. We'll follow you, Nathan. Sure. Daniel, thank you. Yeah. Here we've got Elliot and Ada. They're Hi, Elliot. Hi, Ada. Third year now, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you want to talk about what you're working on? And yeah, um, I'm working on doing the channel in this top plate. Um, so eventually, the purpling, which is the little black and white inlaid strip, is going to go through here. Um, so you basically have the plate and it starts out um, kind of triangular and then you join it, flatten it, get the outline done. And then this is sort of the next step from there. So here's a plate that I already have sort of the channel done on and the arching pretty much done. So this is where this is headed. Um, this will be for the same instrument, but uh, this one's just a little bit further along. It's beautiful. Thank you. So we pretty much do this process with mostly like uh, gouges and thumb planes and some bigger planes, block planes, bench planes. Um, we pretty much like to use whatever the biggest tool that we can is on these to get as consistent of the surface and just sort of have a consistent thing throughout the whole plate. Yeah. Cool. And um, I know you've been here for a few semesters. What um, and as Nathan mentioned, I think you make six violins, um, a, a viola. Yeah, we do um, uh, five violins, a viola, and an optional instrument. Okay. Uh, which usually ends up being another violin. Uh, some students will eventually make a cello if 
that they're fast enough and some students might choose to do a second viola as well. Cool, and what I was wondering is, uh, Elliot, what number is this for you? Yeah, this is my third one. Um, and then I also have a viola that's at kind of the same stage. Um, and actually another violin that's at kind of the same stage. Okay, so, yeah. so that's interesting. So do, do some people make instruments uh, one at a time and finish them? Or is it maybe more common like you? It sounds like you've got three instruments going at the same time. Um, I think it's a little bit of both. Uh, generally, we will work on one all the way through. Um, but just with some of the ways that things worked out with lockdowns and all, there were some projects that were started earlier. Um, I see. Yeah. Yeah, and just sort of going through steps that I already knew how to do um, sort of before learning the other steps. That's great. And in looking at this plate that you have here in, is this called a cradle? Yeah. yeah. Um, I can see there's some like striations here. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, I guess there's a certain kind of plane. Yeah. Is that the roughing yeah. plane that has kind of teeth on it? Yeah, it has these little tooth blade, um, tooth blades in them. So I've actually got over here, but. And I'm curious, what is the, what's the purpose for? Yes. Yeah, Oh, that's cool. I guess it's for removing material. And then when you, as you work finer, having those little ridges is, is it makes it somehow easier to give it shape. Yeah. Part of what we like is that it just doesn't tear out the wood as much. Um, because okay. sometimes with a, a larger surface, you might sort of catch more of the wood at one time and then tear it out. And so this can allow you to remove wood relatively quickly without without damaging, damaging it. it that's great cool thank you for sharing yes yeah um would you also talk about i see some tools on your bench uh yeah. this is oh my gosh i'm having a blank i'm not a scientist oh yeah we've got our our digital calipers here these are new tutorial um they're pretty great uh, they're super accurate. I think they go down to a hundredth of a millimeter. Okay. Um, and so we use these for a lot of our measurements. Um, these are sort of, we use them on almost everything. Right. Uh, and then pretty much everything that we don't use that for, we use these calipers, um, which are like dial calipers. They have a larger area so that you can measure sort of just things that are further in. Nice. And because you're replicating historical instruments, uh, as part of uh, the the method of education here, the I feel like tolerances are uh, something that I hear about um, a lot, and I imagine these are tools that that help you achieve what those high tolerances are. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, we do a lot of things uh, to within at least a tenth of a millimeter of what we're going for, but often a tighter tolerance than that. That's great. Cool. Thank you. Of course. Um, will you share with us, um, here's, here's a question I have is, I feel like violin making is so specific and there are not a lot of entry points for people. There's no like, let's practice violin making to think, you know, about, uh, how to want to, how you want to do that. That's, I feel like with our cabinet and furniture making program, fine woodworking has so many entry points for hobbyists to to kind of take that popcorn trail to get there. What is that like for violin making? And, and if you would share your story, Elliot. Yeah, um, I, think, I think that a lot of people come into it with an interest in violin. Um, we definitely have a number of students that came through that played, um, that at some point sort of went to a shop and found an interest in it there. Um, personally, I wound up sort of starting playing uh, I guess I started playing music when I was about two. Um, I come from a musical family. Uh, and then pretty much at some point when I was in high school, I wound up enrolling in a violin making course at a community college. Uh, and then I started doing that and really liked it and then wanted to pursue a full-time education. That's great. Cool, thanks so much for sharing. All right, so I guess if you started playing music at two, this could be for you. Yeah, could be. <laughs> We'll move on to the right here. We have, we have Ada. She started with Elliot in the program. Hi, Ada. Oh, wow. Thank you, Elliot. Of course. 
What are you working on? I have a viola here, um, which currently I'm working on F holes, the sound holes here, um, which is a lot of very precise cutting with a knife um, because they need to be a certain width and the lines need to be very pleasing to the eye. Um, so they're getting close. They're not done yet, but they're definitely starting to get close. Um, this is a viola that I did a CAD drawing of originally. So oh, cool. we use the Francois Demy method, which is based on like Premini's principles of shapes. And we drew it in Rhino 3D um, during the first COVID lockdown actually. And then we just printed it out and made a template from this. So it's my own geometric construction used to make an internal mold um, which is this shape here, and then right. we make plates from that. So this is the back plate of the viola, cool. which is completely done on the outside and on the inside, hollowed, um, and it's basically ready to glue onto the ribs, which are the sides of the instrument that go here. Um, so it has purfling in it, it, has the whole arch done, all of the graduations done, so there's set thicknesses everywhere. Um, it's thickest right about here, and it gradually thins out um, down to about two millimeters in some of these flanks here. So it's pretty flexible. You can even see it bending. Wow. Um, and this helps make the sound amplified. And yeah, and then the top, the whole outside is done as well. Um, these channels, the purfling miters, um, which are very specific to the maker. That we're working from. So my first three violins were based on Stradivari instruments. And then this is based on a Andrea Guarneri viola. So he worked in the same city as Strad in Cremona um, and was a similar time period, slightly older. Um, and so I had to learn different stylistic shapes in these corners and the purpling miters. The F holes are different. So it's been a lot of changing up how I think about the stylistic parts after spending two years working really hard to get strat shapes into my head. So that's been really interesting. I really enjoyed it, um, especially with the scroll. There was quite a few differences in carving, um, just in like how the turns work and front profiles and side profiles and um, the fluting here. So this is actually angled in this way uh -huh. and it deepens as you get closer to the top. Um, and just all these little stylistic details that we spend a lot of time focusing on here and are super important. Um, so I've spent a lot of time like looking at photos of this maker's work and um, I actually have a couple of them here just to help keep me on track and yeah. And is that the viola that you're looking to copy essentially? It's similar um, right the outline of this is a bit different than that but okay. this is kind of the original inspiration um these f holes are actually a direct copy of that um this is the template i have it's just clear plastic cool um, did you make that that could probably be hard to see i imagine yeah. But, um but yeah we make these um nathan our ta had a drawing of it um that he drew in the same Rhino program. Cool. And yeah, we we just use this thin plastic so that you can place it onto the onto the instrument and trace around. So the the F holes, their shape and their placement, that's uh, really some of it is I guess stylistic, but the main point is how do you get the sound to resonate yeah. out of the cavity of yeah. the violin? So when I was first placing these they were a little bit lower on the instrument i drew it out on paper first so i just had traced the plate and then did all the numbers to see that, how they were looking and they were a little bit lower and we decided to move them up so that this resonating area can move um, unimpeded and if there had been a cutout down here all of this would kind of be dead space because it was separated from the big body here so this area is really important. This distance is important. How much space you have below and above is very important. Um, and then it looks to me, I don't know what these are called, but there's these tiny notches uh, that, that, that are here. Yeah. And, and I feel like when I think about the work that's happening in here, I feel like 
you spend such an amount of time creating these and these very kind of small small actions that you take uh, I, it, I think it takes kind of a, an amount of um, courage, skill, a, a leap of faith in some way to get to this point where you're like, okay, now I'm, now I'm ready to put these shapes in. And yeah. I can see on, on your template, there's, it looks like there's little dots yeah. where those might go. Yeah. That is, um, when might this happen in your process here? Is that kind of next on your list? The notches will be the very last thing I do. So I have a little bit more shaping, especially in these eyes. I'm going to widen them out a little bit. And then, yeah, the notches will be the very last thing I do when I'm happy with everything else. Um, and probably what I'll even do is right now, this is still thicker. It's not finished on the inside yet. I see. So I'll probably thin it down to its final thickness. Um, and then I'll look at the F holes again to make sure I really like the shape. And then after that, I'll do the notches. And the notches guide where the bridge is placed when the instrument's finished. Oh, um, so cool. pretty important. And uh, both for looks and also to guide where you're going to put the bridge right centered between them. And are you maintaining the thickness now because that adds to the strength while you work on other things? Yeah, it adds to the strength. So like these wings aren't too flexible. It also is easier to cut a line on a thicker surface. Um, we do a similar thing when we're doing the outline of the plate where we leave it a couple of millimeters too thick and then cut it down later. So it's just easier to see that things are in the right angle. You're not like tilting your line way out. Um, and it's also just easier to, to place your knife when you have more surface to register on. So cool. I'm also seeing that between your back plate and top plate, these look like they're even different pieces of, of wood here. Yeah. So I have a maple back plate, um, okay. flame maple. So the grain is running vertically. And then the horizontal structure you see is the flame so that it's rippling in the wood, mm -hmm. um, which is very important for violin wood. It's kind of what you look for. Um, the shimmer. Yeah. And it when you move it, it reflects back differently, um, which we really want to retain in varnishing we spend a lot of time making sure that we don't freeze the flame so it won't ripple like this um, and then the top is spruce uh, which is much lighter and has very different hard grain and soft grain which makes doing things like the apples really tricky because the hard grains are very hard and your knife will want to bounce off and then the soft grains just slide right through so the unevenness can be tricky, whereas the maple is much more consistent and ends up being easier to cut, even though it's harder wood. Right. It's somehow counterintuitive when you first start, and then you realize that spruce is actually a lot trickier. That's that's interesting. And then spruce also, I think the grain is very tight. Maybe the whole concept of choosing choosing wood for what your plate uh, will be. There's kind of what it, the, like geography, and there's yeah. a whole. It's almost its own science in itself yeah. yeah i was lucky this fall um we get a lot of our wood from a supplier in vermont actually who imports it from europe and elliot and i went up and picked out the whole year's supply of wood for the department which was a really cool field trip of going through this whole barn of wood and selecting all the pieces that we needed and getting to actually pick exactly what we want rather than just what they ship us so that was a really neat experience um and definitely helped me learn how to sort through wood really quickly and quickly ditch things that I don't want and then really hone in on what I do want, which is like grain direction in different angles. Um, everything needs to be super straight, weight, uh, tightness of the grain, and obviously no like knots or resin pockets or things like that. So cool. Can I ask you also about the purfling? Like the purfling also, similar to the sound holes, it's beautiful. Uh, is there a practical purpose for purfling? Yeah, it helps stop cracks. So if you have a crack from the edge that's going into the violin, it will the purfling breaks up the wood so then it wouldn't travel up into your plate. And then potentially cause much more damage if it's traveled up so because we've cut out wood and added in this new strip it helps stabilize all those sorts of things 
Nice. Yes. And now I'm also seeing in my frame some of these tools. And are, are these, um, did you make the handles for these also? Yeah. So this handle was one of the very first woodworking projects I did here. Um, my probably third, second or third week of school. And it's the same maple we use in violins and then ebony on the outsides, which is super strong and dense and works really well. And we practice all of our woodworking techniques, planing things straight and square to certain thicknesses, um, drilling holes for these little screws that hold the knife in, um, gluing things together, shaping it all on the outside. So this was shaped with a block plane and a file and a chisel to get all these curves. And then we also practice our varnishing on it. So this I've actually varnished a couple times with different things just to see what I like. Um, but it's, we really take time with our knife handles so that we can get some experience before we go into the violin. And then this one is mahogany, um, which I had an interesting piece of, I think it was from my dad, who's a cabinet maker. Oh, nice. Given me this. Um, and I'm actually really happy with this one. It's it has a seam down the side, mm -hmm. but it was cut from the same piece of wood. So it really just looks like one thing. It does. I can't see the seam. <laughs> There's a seam like two thirds of the way over so that we could cut out a groove for the knife. Um, these ones are removable. You just loosen these screws and slide it out to sharpen. This one's actually glued in. So when I sharpen it, it stays in the handle. But I really enjoy doing knife handles. And it's always a great way to practice new varnishes that we're making or new ways of like ground finishes um, because they have some amount of curve similar to a violin plate. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're just using like a strip of rib wood, the curves influence how the varnish behaves. So they're really good practice. Cool, thank you for sharing. Yeah, of course, thank you. Uh, and then Ada, while, while we're with you, um, will you share with us sort of um, your background and your pathway uh, to coming to North Bend Street School? Yeah, so I was homeschooled my entire life um, from a kid up through high school. And I spent a lot of time just being able to explore what I was actually interested in, other than academics. So. Um, my dad is a cabinet maker. I grew up in his shop from a tiny child and I worked for him in high school, which I really enjoyed and got a good amount of woodworking experience that helped get me started here, even though it was definitely different. And then I also played fiddle traditional music for about 10 years before I came. Um, and somehow the combination of the two woodworking background and music led me here. I was also a professional hand weaver in high school. Um, actually wove these bench mats for the you did. Yeah, um, over the summer. So I was weaving reproduction textiles for museums and collectors for a few years and really enjoyed it, but ultimately decided I didn't want to keep doing that full time. And violin making felt like a really good fit, combining all the things that I enjoy in one industry. Um, I, I knew a couple of graduates from here who were in Vermont, who told me about Roman and the program and just had great things to say. Um, and I visited here first when I was 17. And I remember you came with your whole family. family. Yeah, my whole family came in toward the school and got to meet current students at that time. Um, and then, yeah, I applied that same fall. And I started when I was 18, as young as you can be to start. I came the first semester. I was old enough. So, yeah. That's I'm great. Really glad. And it's all it's all worked out better than I could imagine, for sure. And I'm really looking forward to a career in this industry. Ada, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you guys. Cool. And thank you, Elliot. We can uh, move on to Daniel's bench now. Okay, and great. Catch back up with him, see what he's working on. All right. Now that his tools are nice and sharp. <laughs> How are you, Daniel? Good, I'm good. Um, so right now I'm working. Uh, I've got two little projects going on right now. Um, this is my first violin. Um, right now, I've uh, got it prepared to put on the fingerboard, which I can show you guys. Pretty cool, actually. Um, cool. And so I just uh, glued on my saddle, which is this little part down here. Um, you make it out of a piece of ebony, and then you make it square, and you put the, put the little marks in it, and then you glue it in. Um, so I've got that going right now. 
And then I've got uh, this plate going right now, which I'm working on my corners. Um, and so what I'm doing, what I'm looking for right now is there's a lot of like symmetry um, on, on, on these corners. I, I need to make sure that they are similar in width. I need to make sure that they're a correct length from the scribe line that we have here. Um, I'm also making sure that the edge of this is, is correct and square. So when we, when we check for that, we check to see if it's square so that um, when we put our purfling in, it's correct. And, and that we have a correct amount of overhang uh, when we put when we put this plate on our on our rib structure, that there's a correct amount of overhang. Um, but yeah, that's what I have going on right now. It's 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 a little 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 bit tedious at times because you're making little cuts and then you're checking it and then you're making little cuts and checking it, but it's fun. I like it. Cool. And then Daniel, will you share with us um, sort of your story, your pathway into? Uh, finding uh, North Bend Street School and wanting to become uh, a violin maker. Yeah, so um, in high school, I, so I've been playing violin since I was four. Um, I've trained with Suzuki, so classically trained. And, um, and so that's been my love and my passion for all of my life. Um, and so I got to high school, I was doing all these music groups and and I kept asking myself, like, what do I want to do after 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 high school and college? I I, I knew that I wasn't cut out for like a, a regular four year school, and like I knew that I wasn't going to do well in there. And and so I I was looking and looking, and I finally found being a luthier, and it's woodworking and violin combined, which is the two most biggest passions that I have in my life. Right. And um, and I I contacted the school and I took a tour. I even talked to Nate, actually, my first tour here. Um, and now we're here. Um, almost had my first one done. It's, uh, it's been a very, very long process, but very rewarding. I'm very blessed to be here. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at. That's great. Thanks for sharing. And if I remember correctly, I think you have a wood shop in your basement growing up too. Yeah, yeah. I had my grandfather had a, had a wood woodworking uh, benches set up in my in my basement, and um, I've gotten very lucky to have that. So that if I ever like if, like when during COVID, I could like go down there and work and 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 do that. I could take work home with me um, and work on it there. So. I'm very fortunate to have that. Yeah. Cool. Daniel, thank you so much. Of course. Now we'll move on to Hannah. She's doing some arching right now. Hi, Hannah. Hi. I'm actually doing the edge thickness. Oh, my bad. But it's also kind of the same thing. Yeah. Um, the lighting is beautiful on that. Oh, good. Um, this is actually one of my favorite tools and this jig thing that's holding my plate. Um, it's called a ball joint jig, and it's a really good example of just how well equipped North Bennett Street is. Um, but without it, I would just be like punched over working on that. But this really protects my back and allows me to sit really comfortably and upright while working. And it's also really good for my wrist in particular, because if I'm doing that, I can like just unlock it like that, put it in a different position, work on a different piece. Um, so I'm glad you've come right now. This is definitely one of my favorite tools. Cool. Um, yeah, this is my third violin. Nice. Just bringing the edge height down so that I can start to make it, um, start to work on the arching, which I've roughly started on the back there. Okay. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. You, you mentioned ergonomics a little bit. Was yeah. there um, a bit of a, an adjustment for you to get used to working with the tools that we use? Definitely. Um, at first, you know, random muscles in my wrist <laughs> or back would hurt. Um, and I think part of the learning process that our teachers here are really good about is making sure that you're learning in a way with healthy habits so that your body can keep doing this as long as you want to. 
Um, Cause I definitely have read about people where they don't necessarily take care of their back and stretch and ergonomically um, protect their body while they're working. So that can just keep going. <laughs> Yes, yeah, so much of the trades are like that, right? You just kind of uh, t treat yourself like a shovel, yeah. and, uh, and it's it's not sustainable. So that's fantastic to hear that uh, you have tools and and are being mindful of uh, of what this means for you to set you up for long term success. Yeah, a lifetime of violin making needs a healthy body. <laughs> so, and Hannah, will you tell us? Um, uh, your story, your your pathway of, of coming to North Bend Street School? Yeah, I am one of Rob's uh, longest applicants. It took me seven or eight years to finally come here. Um, I applied in high school originally, uh, and I knew that this would be good for me, not because I played viola, but I do love playing viola as well, um, but because I did painting in high school, um, and I was very happy to spend, like, 60 hours in a week or two just painting like one small painting um and this is kind of more of that where we're just working on one thing to make it as beautiful as we can um it's kind of like the best indulgence ever if you're a perfectionist with your craft <laughs> that's so, great yeah thank you well i'm uh as long as it took i'm so glad you're here yeah I decided to go to college and travel the world for about seven years before coming. But in the end, I was like, I just have to go to North Bennett Street because uh, the violins coming out of here are definitely the best. So, yeah. Thank you. Good luck with your instrument. Your third instrument, you said? Yeah. Great. Let's say hi to Veronica now. Hi. Hi, Veronica. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? I'm pretty good. Um, I am finalizing the graduation of my uh, viola back plate right now. So that process is basically um, establishing the thickness of the plate at each individual section. Um, and I'm pretty much close to the finish line here. All the thicknesses are about what I was um, aiming for. And more importantly, the flexibility is where I'd like it to be. Um, there's some like guideline numbers that we um, have in mind as we start, but it's really more important to respond to the individual piece of wood. And this one is a pretty average flexibility weight um, piece of wood, so I don't have to really manipulate that too much. Um, it's moving the way back it should. Um, so right now I'm basically just removing any two blade marks that are left and smoothing out, um, using low light to find all these little ripples um, and smooth those out. Um, yeah. Cool. So you mentioned there's there's measurements that you're working towards, but that there's also the feel uh, as well that you as the maker are are kind of uh, making compromises or making judgments along the way. Is this one of the reasons why the robots will never take over <laughs> this this job? Yeah, for sure. Um, this is definitely one of those um, elements where a human hand is is necessary to. Um, make sure that you're maximizing the potential of the wood and uh, achieving something that's going to uh, play as best as it can. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm also thinking about this process specifically of um, smoothing out the, the final surface a little differently this time because we recently had a guest lecture from MIT, the physics department come, and he was sharing some findings about how according to their metrics that they were measuring at least, mm -hmm. the, the um, smoothness of the inside of an instrument shouldn't really affect the sound. Again, by their metrics, things like dynamics, uh, resonance. So one of the things that I'm keeping in mind as I'm doing this is more like, uh, you know, pride of craftsmanship. Right. You know? Like you wouldn't be able to see some of the things that I'm working on here, just peeking through the f -holes. But you um, know. But I know. And then uh, the other thing is, if this viola maximizes its lifespan, that top is gonna get popped up eventually. Like. The Someone's going to repair it, and right, yeah. So you know, ideally, this thing is going to live for you know a long time. And when somebody does open it up, I want to be able to be proud of you know the way it looks and every element. That's great. I'm I'm curious. You're you're close to graduation, uh, and I feel like with a lot of the programs here at North Bennett Street School, you know, people people have to arrive with 
being pretty focused. I mean, violin making uh, as an industry, as a career is so focused. Um, you're here for 30 months of training. Will you share with us a little bit about um, your, your, your experience here? In, because I feel like when I think about visiting here, it almost seems like it's a, a salon or a, a community, a community where if people are interested in in thinking about direction or things like that, that that it's almost like a it complements the curriculum of actually making. Will you talk about that and and specifically to you and um, what that means? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'd say that uh, I've definitely found it to be the case that we work together as a class to really um, create. Uh, a culture of focus and uh, dedication and, um, you know, helping each other out. And it's uh, sort of a stew of all of our personalities and, uh, you know, drive that sort of set that tone here. Um, and yeah, it makes it easy to really, you know, just come in, put your, put your head down get work done. And the day kind of flies by because um, it, it is a very specific pursuit. So we all are really dedicated and, you know, you're not going to really <laughs> stick around too long if you're not uh, in it for the long haul. So, yeah. Cool. And then can I ask you, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, I guess, give, give shape to my own question here. It's like, um, I'm wondering mm -hmm. if when you arrived as a new student here, did you have any um, idea of what you might want to do when you're graduating? And, and now that you're, you know, here, has that changed? Yeah, for sure. Um, I came to North Penetrate School um, having just worked at a at a shop in New York City that focuses mostly on restoration. Um, so I was uh, coming from that environment where I saw uh, just how much restoration work there is out there. And also I was pretty fascinated by the process of it, what I was able to observe while I was there. So I came into school figuring I'd you know, uh, end up focusing on restoration. Um, but, you know, through the process of making, it's a pretty, it's a pretty easy uh, process to fall in love with. So I'm actually uh, about to move on from school to uh, another shop in New York City and be focusing on restoration after all. But oh, I'm, great. I'm also definitely planning on uh, keeping making in my life. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's sort of weave back and forth <laughs> my uh, vision. But, uh, yeah, trying to sort of incorporate it all in the end. Cool. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, and and uh, I know we'll stay in touch, but also wish you the best in the, the next leg of your journey. I think um, maybe we could take a peek into the varnish room. This is a pretty exciting room for us because uh, you get to see your instrument go from being in the white, which is without any finish on it, cool. to... Uh, developing some color. You mind if I hit the exhaust fan so we can get nice sound in here? Uh, sure. Yeah. Just for a few minutes. Definitely. Everybody hold your breath. <laughs> All right. Thank you. This is our UV light box and um, the UV helps the varnish dry faster. And uh, rather than letting it sit out for uh, days on end, we can accumulate coats of varnish quite quickly. Um, and this, this we had designed, I think Roman designed it himself and put it together. Um, got a nice box that has with some lights. Oh. Yep. So these are violins that are cooking? Yep, they're uh, accumulating coats and they get put in front of the UV lights. They'll hang out there. Has to be very well vented because the UV lights heat up very quickly. We've got our hot plate and vent set up so we can uh, cook our own varnish. Um, we'll heat oils and um, uh, make all sorts of finishes in this room, uh, as well as apply those finishes to the instruments themselves. Uh, these three windows here give us a lot of wonderful natural light. Uh, it's a bit dreary today, so. Not an ideal day for, for varnishing, but um, it's still pretty light and airy in here. Um, 
we've got a couple instruments here as well. Um, they'll, they'll tend to go from a lighter color if you accumulate coats, and then they end up being a bit darker and richer in color. Um, this reminds me of the, the picture that Ada has on her bench. The oh, kind of two the two, two islands, yeah, yeah, the front and the back next to each other. Definitely. Um, yeah, the, the light that we get in here when it's sunny, uh, usually around nine o'clock in the morning, uh, it, it's just phenomenal. And uh, it's, it's important to see the instrument in different lights so you can get a sense for how the color uh, might change depending on the lighting situations. Most of the time, these instruments won't be outside, um, but it's good to see a true color represented in that way. Uh, and um, we also try to make sure that we look at these varnishes under uh, fluorescent lights and different different types of lighting situations so they don't look... Um, if you put too much red in an instrument, let's say, and you have like an orange light under it, it really makes it look almost fluorescent if there's too much color in it. So hmm. it can be really nice in one lighting, but really terrible in another lighting. So you want to make sure that it will get I'm just going to show people at home a little bit of a close up of, of this, even in this light here. And then I think I heard that you sometimes will make your own finishes and, and that there's some amount of experimentation there and that apparently Ada has, has come up with a concoction that, that uh, everybody's pretty excited about. Yeah, we're, we're testing some new um, ways to create the varnish and uh, it's still, the, she mentioned testing things on knife handles and mm -hmm. it, it, it's still kind of in that stage at the moment, but uh, we're very excited about how promising uh, the work is that she has put into this, this particular way of making varnish. Good. And yeah. I guess we got to keep that a secret and uh, forget I mentioned it. <laughs> there, there's a bit of like, you know, secret sauce kind of stuff yeah. involved with it, but, you know, it, it's... Um, very widely available. When you get into varnish making, uh, it becomes chemistry. And um, when you study the chemistry and follow the rules, then you can get great results from it. So uh, if you like if you like chemistry, if you like baking, uh, following rules, timings, temperatures, uh, varnish making can be a lot of fun. And um, sometimes uh, just trying to make the instrument becomes overwhelming enough. So the varnish just kind of gets set aside as an afterthought, mm -hmm. um, but there's so much to be achieved out of it and, and so much to learn from it uh, that if you can carve out the time for yourself, no pun intended, of course, yes. uh, within the program, then um, it, it's a really great avenue of research. We all do have to write a paper um, during our time in the program and uh, it's it's side interests like that where you can do a little research and come up with a topic that you're really interested in that you might not get to experience otherwise. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. Um, I would uh, I would love to learn a little bit about the Glowforge over here. Uh, and I know Roman is here teaching. I'd love to say hello to him and and um, give him a chance to say hello to our audience as well. Definitely. Uh, new to our program this year is a laser cutter that um, we had received a grant to purchase it. And um, it's been named Johan yeah. McGlowforge. Yeah, apparently. We have some creative people here that stick labels on things. And um, you might think that introducing this kind of technology is um, uh, not what we want to be doing in uh, like a handmade mm -hmm. environment. Anti-Luddite. Yeah. And um, we're not trying to replace any, uh, any of the craftsmanship values. Uh, we're using this as a tool for prototyping templates and um, tools that will aid us in uh, the creation of the violins. So 
instead of spending time with the tool making and um, template making, uh, we can spend time working on the instruments instead. That's great. So you can make a template there, bring it back to your bench, or bring it home to a bench. Yeah. Uh, and it just it helps it helps the the process go a little bit faster. Yeah, and we can test out different geometries for templates very quickly. Uh, we don't have to spend time making a template by hand and then realizing, oh darn, you know, it's not really exactly what I wanted. So Ada had mentioned that um, computer aided design software. Uh, that we're using in conjunction with this to um, do some geometric research for templates and um, really be able to push forward the, the design aspect of the instrument um, so we can come up with more accurate ways of um, using existing resources as inspiration for what we're working on. It's a beautiful evolution. Uh, I feel like this is something in my visits here, say five years plus ago, this this kind of technology um, or ability wasn't here. And that combined with, I would say probably the people like you and, and Ada and, and Roman being supportive of moving this direction is, is, is really exciting. Yeah, it's, um, it's a technology that can be very easily abused. Um, and there's a, a large responsibility that comes along with it to maintain what, what we believe to be the integrity of our craftsmanship. So we, um, we like to make sure that people know that we use it very carefully. Cool. Thank you. Maybe we can try to go find Roman. That sounds great. Cool. Aha. There he is. Hi, Roman. How are you? Very good. How are you? Turn that fan back on. Hello. Hey, this is Roman Barnes. He's the head of the program. Uh, uh, I'm, I also feel like one thing we haven't talked about is in this program, uh, every violin um, that students make, they get to keep. And I like this as a concept because, you know, you, you invest in this, so. Yes, it, it feels uh, as when we work on the instrument that belongs to us, we put even more into it. It is, uh, it is not at that point just the training piece, but it becomes our own piece. So it is, becomes more personal and usually outcome is much, maybe not much, but better than, than when we don't own the instrument. That's, Roman, you and I have uh, had a couple conversations recently, and I feel like for the people that are thinking of coming to violin making, we've heard uh, a number of stories from from uh, the people that are in the program right now. Um, but I feel like when we talked like a week ago, you had sort of broken down into categories, uh, you know, types of, of yes. uh, almost like archetypes of people that you see coming. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, the naturally people uh, who are interested in violin making are musicians. Very often they're violinists who like violin. They visit violin shops. They they see how the work is done. They got, some of them get interested in it and some of them get to the point that they want to do it themselves. So that's a very natural way to go transition to the violin. But there is also another type of person who may be not even a violin player, but they, have a, they, they like the engineering part, part of it. And they wonder why is this little sound box made of wood so mysterious still and sounds so good and they like to have a crack on it and make a good instrument that sounds as good as as possible hopefully uh, matching the old violins if, if possible so so this is this could be an engineer this could be a person who is just very technically inclined and just just wants to one wants to make a violin to help him understand what makes it work there is also artistic type of person who who like uh, art and they like the shape of the violin. There is a lot of carving in the instrument. There is a, there's a very beautiful design that came from basically Renaissance Baroque in Italy. So this is uh, something that uh, there, there are uh, aspects of violin that are just plain beautiful and, and some people can recognize it and they just wanna recreate the same beauty. And of course, we look in the varnish, which is another total subject there uh, to 
recreate beautiful varnish that it's a lot of alchemy and chemistry going together and then also artistic choices about the colors and recognition so of the of the what's nice and what looks nice so there are these technical engineering types there is a type of musician who wants to make beautiful varnish to play there are artistic uh, people who just like how it looks it's uh, to make a good violin uh, successful pay person has to have a little bit of each and they need to understand certain uh, technical aspects they need to have a good artistic eye which we train here for the shapes and they also have to have a musician because uh, in them in, in some level they don't have to be a players but but it's good to hear music understand uh, the tonal differences because eventually we want these instruments to be enjoyed by the musicians and are they by their own gifts. Cool. And Roman, any advice for anyone uh, if they're thinking of coming in this direction of, of being a maker? What are what are the things people should be thinking about or doing um, in order to think about coming in this direction? I think it's nice to think about this as a as a career change, as a serious uh, commitment time wise. And uh, and it's good to understand that the the training takes some time. So it's good to to commit solid time into it and be patient with them with, with yourself. So if someone wants to come to the violin, uh, make a violin, they need to understand that the process we can make first violin, the next one is better. So process of building the experience is is quite extensive, but then also very rewarding at that. If we can make nice instruments with good skills, it becomes very pleasant. And will you share with us a little bit about your um, your philosophy of teaching or creating a, a, a culture here of, uh, of makers? Definitely. For us, a successful school and for successful teacher is when they have successful students and graduates. So when we see graduates uh, making nice instruments, getting awards, getting gold medals out there in the in the big world, and their instruments are appreciated by good musicians, um, or they get hired by very high level and and, and difficult to get uh, violent businesses, violent shops. That's how I feel we are successful. So most of our attention goes into the students, into the school into the classroom just to help them out to make the first steps and set them up on the trajectory to, to making very good work out after graduating. That's great. Roman, thank you very much. I think that brings us right to the top of the hour. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to you, Roman. Thank you, thank you uh, Nathan. And, and thank you, um, everybody uh, here in Violin Making and Repair. Um, Appreciate it. And uh, if anybody in the audience wants to buy a violin, right? We have them here. <laughs> cool. Thanks, everyone. All right. We're going to go right down the hallway to jewelry making and repair. How's it going, everybody? Some of our carpentry students that we visited a little bit earlier. And we're on the second floor here at North Bend Street School in the North Building, which is violin making, carpentry, and jewelry making and repair. Hello, hello, hello. Hey. How are you, Anne? Good. How are you? Good. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Do you have a control for the fans at all? Uh, so the noise we're hearing is actually our torque, which we're going to need in the Perfect. Room, but I can turn it off for the time being if that's helpful. Uh, let's just roll with it. All right, let's just roll with it. Perfect. So welcome to Solar Making and Repair. Every tour that I do actually starts over here at our cases, uh -huh. so whether it's virtual or IRL. So we're going to turn these good folks around and come over here. Very good. So all of the work in these two cases are examples of work done by students and work that's in the curriculum. 
So the case that we're in front of right now is all examples of our stone setting, everything from our most basic projects down here in front to some of our more involved projects at the back, which are done in gold, platinum, and palladium. And then we have examples of some of the tools that we use for that work as well. If we come around the corner to our smaller case, we have examples of things in the curriculum um, that are a little bit earlier in the program, a little bit more basic. So some of our tool making exercises, um, sawing and filing, some of our most basic stone setting. We're actually going to be talking about this style of stone setting today, a little bit of engraving. And then a really fun workshop seminar that we had last year that I hope to repeat in the future, where we start to explore um, other unusual materials. So in addition to platinum, gold, palladium, silver, we've got some examples of Damascus steel actually in the case here. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So cool. keeping up with all the interesting things that are going on in the So obviously all this work takes place in this shop. So we're gonna take a little walk. Um, underneath the cases, you'll see these big messy trays. Every project in the curriculum, and there are just over 50, um, has an attendant project sheet and a series of samples. So this is an example of our project library. So all these trays in all their glorious mess are samples and uh, process pieces so students can see what we want to do as well as sometimes what we don't want to do. We absolutely embrace our mistakes. Um, most of the teaching takes place in this area here at the front of the shop. Um, our teaching bench is behind this monitor. Thankfully, we're not actively in COVID protocols right now, so students are welcome to watch demos on screen or at the bench, whatever is more comfortable for them. Our laser welder also lives up here, as well as some of our gem ID equipment. As we move this way, every shop needs a good sink. So this is our cleaning area. We have our pickle pot, our ultrasonic, our steamer. Some very fundamental mass finishing equipment. And then this is our soldering area. We're gonna be spending some time here today doing both some annealing and some soldering. Both students and I are gonna be taking, taking the group through um, some projects and exercises. This way, we have a draw bed, which is coming to play today. We're gonna to see that in action. We're gonna see that in action today, yep. Our forming area, some of our casting equipment and wax equipment. This is our grinding and polishing area. We take safety really seriously here. So uh, this is a setup for students to work with ventilation at our flexible shaft machines, as well as two of our stand-up polishing units, all of them with dust collection. The anvil's back here, which tends to be a big hit. Everyone likes an anvil. Or a pun. So, <laughs> so this is uh, one of the tools that we use for heavier, heavier duty forming, forging, etc. We're going to move into the student bench area now. Got some students at work. This central bay is where our first year, first semester students get started. Um, everyone is supplied with the basics. So a bench, a desk lamp, a flexible shaft and fundamental hand tools, the tools that we would expect to find on a well-equipped jeweler's bench. So things like the pliers you see up here on the rack, uh, the mallet that's hanging out up there. Students also purchase their own consumables and measuring tools. So we're gonna see those coming into play today. And as students get more settled in the program and they move into their second year, the bench setup gets a little bit more complex. So this is an example of two second year bench setups. Joanna's going to be taking us through some stone setting in a little while. But what you're going to see is she has a microscope. She has dedicated dust collection. So as students move through the program, uh, their tool needs change. Um, you'll also see that Joanna has a whole lot more stuff on her bench. So the process of accumulating tools happens throughout the entire, entire process of the program. That's great. And we have other work areas scattered here and there, but enough about the work areas. 
We have a schedule change today. I know we promised people ring basics. Okay. But we changed it up. My first year students actually were a lot more interested in talking to everyone about chain making. So we're going to talk about our link chain project. Um, and I'm going to let Audrey and Bella, our first year students, take it away from here. Okay. Thanks, Anne. Hey, Audrey. Hi. Hey, Bella. Good. Hi, um, I'm Audrey. I'm Bella. We're first year students as Anne said. And we're actually going to move right over this way. Okay. So we kind of start off. We're going to be moving around a lot. Okay. We'll do our best to follow you. Yeah, it's okay. We'll take a long second. This is a nice little overview of what we're going to be doing. Um, making a chain link bracelet. So you can see it's a bunch of rings that are interconnected. And we make those rings over here from wire. That wire is then wrapped around a form. A coil is made. That's from wrapping. The coil is cut and we get these rings. And then the rings are put together into a chain. So that's an overview of what we're doing today. Um, something that we do in studios is order wire in thicker and larger cages, easier to store and more versatile that way. So the first step is getting that thick wire to be thinner in a smaller cage. Um, that requires some math, which is a brief um, picture of our math over here. I'm not going to go through it, but going back to geometry and volume, figure out how much of the thicker stuff do you need in order to make the right amount of thinner, longer stuff. But yeah. I'm curious to see what your process is here. The math? The, 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 the make it going from thicker to thinner. The overall idea is that the volume doesn't change. And so you set the two volumes equal to each other, and then you solve for what's unknown. Cool. I could really geek out about it if you wanted to, but let's do the fun stuff instead. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess okay. the visual too is that this right here, this like nine and a half inch thick one, will get you about a meter of thin stuff. Right. All right, so we are going to move down this way. This is where the stretcher comes into play. Okay, okay. So this is the drawing bench. Here is a drawing shape here. I'll get into that in a second. Okay. Draw arms here. So we want to get to this wire here. So we kind of got an in-between for you guys. So this is 14 gauge and we want to move to 16 gauge. Okay. Uh, so it did start here. We went to 14 and then I'll show you how to get down to this now. You don't have to follow me. I'll be right back. Oh, okay. I just put it down there. All right. So this is the 14 gauge. We want to move it down to the 16. So there is a little, um, a thinner area at the top here so that it can fit through the draw plate. So I'm going to start, show you this here. I'm going to start at 14. So this is the gauge where it doesn't fit all the way in. You see that there? Yes. And then if you go to the one before it, 13, it goes through. So we're choosing that 14 one where it doesn't, it doesn't go all the way through. Okay. Hey, Audrey, what's that called? This, the drop plate. All right. And then I'm going to grab the draw tongs. Change the bigger one. Oh, so the, the tension of once you get those hooks on is, is what is what holds the other end of that piece of wire. So then we 
use this dice here. Pull it through. Watch out, it might bring up a little bit more. Yes, yeah, so I would move it. Okay. So then once it's through, we can. So we'll measure it here. So we want to move this down to 1.3, correct? So we're at 1.68 right now, and we want to move it down to 1.3. So we would just continue this process going downward. And then we would go to the next one. So on so forth. Oh, and I can see on the draw plate, there's like a, it's beveled or there's like a cone, a channel. Um, And then it's easy to put it on one side and then draw it out the other yeah. side. Yeah. Like that, uh, it's it is. Like <laughs> you have to make sure this is secured so that it doesn't. So once it's connected in here, this tightens and closes. Right. Access it. Oh, someone's asking on the chat uh, what the material is here that we're using. That we're using this is sterling silver. Sterling silver. It is. Sterling silver is very specific. It's actually 92.5% silver. It's about 7.5% copper for All right. You'd be able to notice this, but this is much longer than what it was to start off with. It is. For our audience, it's absolutely much longer. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to put this another time. We're at about 1.4 right now. We want to be at 1.2. So it's a 13 here. Yeah. Again, this is the So a theme here, again, patience with the process. This is all about um, small increments. Small increments. You can imagine it was, it took much longer when it started at 10 days than when it started. And tolerances. I think what's interesting about today, going to violin making and coming to jewelry making and repair, both programs, I feel like, uh, use some of the highest tolerances uh, because of the work that's done here. Absolutely. In this job, we need tolerance of below attention. It's time to get there, but we'll see how much further I have to go now because it has, has gotten much. much. All right, perfect. It's at 1.2 now, so the next step is you take this wire that has been thinned out. And we wrap it around and make the point. Because this has been stretched, um, it's been work hardened, um, and it would need to get annealed before using it. So, for time sake, we actually already have an annealed piece. Uh huh. And we'll talk about annealing more in depth later. Um, process of heat treating it so that it is um, softer again, so you can actually bend it. So. Now what we're doing is making a coil. Here's a sample coil in copper. Um, we use this form. This is actually a transfer punch. It transfers a um, center to another piece, but it's not what we're using it for. Okay. <laughs> um, we're using it as a solid base to wrap the wire around. Um, and we use a vise to keep things still. And it's pretty simple. We just pull and wrap. Um, so you want to make sure it's stable in there, so you have bent the edge, so there's contact between the wire and the mandrel we're using. This is a specific diameter, it's 3 16 um, because that is the specific coil size 
the interior 405 diameter diameter we'd like. So again, this goes back to the math on the board. Um, you have to calculate what size rings you want, how right. many rings you want, what the inside diameter of that ring is, what blank you would cut for that, and how many. Uh, so I find this stuff kind of fun, <laughs> but it's also not fun for them. No, it's fascinating. I, uh, I worked on the retail side of jewelry and often wondered about how things are made and why. And, and I feel like even though I've been here for quite some time, I'm learning so much today uh, about, about this process. It's pretty cool. All right, two key words for making the coil is out and down. You really want to stack them. What you don't want is any space in between each of the coils. So in pulling down, you're putting pressure on the length below in hopes to reduce there being any chance of being space between each rack. It's amazing how malleable the material is. Yeah, we'll talk more about annealing in a moment, but um, it's that hardening and annealing is that process, or hardening, most people will probably experience with a paper clip. When you bend a paper clip back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, it eventually breaks. Right. So you've work hardened it and it's become harder, but it's also become more brittle. So you can't work with it as well. So that process of heating and kneeling gets things back into the right uh, orientation to be malleable and soft again. My hand is getting sweaty, which is not helpful. <laughs> It looks cool just in its form like that. I feel like I could put that on something and. It's actually a way uh, you can make really primitive tubing. Huh. And it's worth noting, while well, Audrey, why, 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 that sterling silver, even though I mentioned that it has this copper additive for hardness, sterling silver is actually really, really soft. So, Rob, you are observing that it's moving really easily. Mm -hmm. Sterling silver is one of the metals that actually moves really readily. It's great for, for students because it's fairly uh, forgiving as opposed to some of our gold alloys, which can be really rigid and really springy. All right, so we're getting to the end here where it gets really complicated. You have to do this little dance. Yeah. And what you'll probably see as Audrey lets go of the pressure on this mm -hmm. is rather than the coil springing like this, the coil actually compresses downward because she's been putting that down with pressure. It closes up gaps. Oh. Oh. oh, there it is. Nice. All right. Now we're going to actually move on over to the solder station. Okay. Beautiful coil she made. Cool. All right. So, and she's getting everything started for us. Okay. Audrey's uh, going to anneal this, and I know we haven't really talked about it. We've said annealing a lot, but we haven't really talked about it. So, annealing is when we heat the metal for a specific amount of time at a specific temperature, and it changes the structure in the metal. Uh, the atoms in the metal almost uh, move away from each other. It kind of makes a malleable, ductile uh, piece of metal that we can use much easier. Um, and then as we work with it, it gets work hardened. We might have to anneal it again. It's kind of just a back and forth 
process. So with this, instead of with just like a regular wire, we don't want to heat directly on top of it because we want every single um, one of those jump rates to get heat in the center and the outside everywhere. So Audrey is actually going to heat on the charcoal block okay. around the foil. Uh, and that will make sure that every single bit of this gets meal because the worst thing is that we have half of it meal and half of it broken. Um, so, oh, go ahead. Just what I put on there is called plus. Okay. It has two functions. It protects the metal from getting too scorched, and it also is an indicator. So it, um, it changes with temperature, and it can be our thermometer, and it can let us know what temperature we get to. Because we want to get to 1100 Fahrenheit. Um, that's the temperature at which sterling silver annuals. The only other thing I would add is uh, the medium that these folks are working on. So different materials require a different substrate. So this is charcoal, and we use charcoal for very specific things. Like mouth fire. What? So mouth fire. Fire. Mal -fire. fire. fire. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want camera to get a big seven times. So what Audrey is writing is what's called an dual fuel core system. So we have natural gas and oxygen. And for strikers, they were a little bit of trouble today. Believe it or not, lighting the course is one of the skill sets that we have to really learn. It's not as easy as it looks. So this is just gas right now. Okay. And now we're adding oxygen. You'll see it gets more of a firm shape to the flame. It gets, cool. a, it gets two columns. It's the inner column and the outer column. Lot a flame that's neutral, slightly reducing. Um, that's a yellow little tip of the inner column. All right. My fellow said, I'm going around. Getting the block. The block, charcoal block is really heat absorbent and helps distribute the heat evenly. The next step after this is quenching. So I'll be putting this top thing in this thing of water, which needs to be done carefully in a tube like this because, oh, it's starting to. All right, there we go. Get my uh, try to do it upright if I can. Right. <laughs> we appreciate that. All right. So that's a meal. And you can see it has some kind of gross stuff on it from the flux. Mm -hmm. um, so what happens now is we walk over to the sink area. Okay. And it goes in the pickle pot. The pickle pot. Is a beautiful crock pot, um, and it's a warm liquid with acid in it. Okay. And that helps get rid of any oxidation and any junk in the box. Instead of waiting for this, we actually have one already in the other book at my bench. So we'll just head back this way. I know. Oh, we're that's moving. great. I know we're moving it. No, we're good. We like to. We like the activity. Here is the coil. And today I am going to be using uh, this piece of wood right here as a dowel. And I'm going to put this on here like this. This is a not necessary step, but definitely a helpful one. It keeps it nice and stable. It's hard um, to get dependent on this though, because you might not have the right uh, size of wood to help you out. But for today, I'm going to use that. I am going to. Use a fresh saw blade. So I have a fresh four out saw blade here. If you're going to hear it here, it's nice and um, secure. I'm going to show you how we would put this in. So you want to make sure the teeth are going downwards. This is like the bench test. Yeah. 
this is the bench test. <laughs> Not the jump rings, but something. Right. All right. And you want to tighten this in here so it is nice and tight. All right. So you kind of want to make sure you are getting the most amount of coils possible as you do this. So um, you want to start at a place that makes sense. Like right at the end of that curve, that's what right. you're looking for. The hardest part is pulling it steady and Right, and getting it started. Once it's started, it's a little easier. So I'm just going to cut a couple of these. You want to make sure you're moving your fingers out of the way. All right, and if you see, I'm going at kind of an angle so that I'm starting the next one. Oh, yeah. As I'm working on the one I'm working on. And then your dowel is just collateral damage. It is, but then you can kind of move this up forward so you don't completely destroy the dowel. That's cool. they stack up on the subway. Yeah. That's I was just gonna ask. Yeah. So as they fall off, you get these little rings. So cool. Sorry, I'm zoomed in a little no, bit here. Totally so fine. all right. So here are some examples of the rings. These ones have been soldered already. So we have some soldered here, so they're closed. And then this one is not. Um we just chose the copper here so you can see the difference uh, and that. really see the link. So this is when we start to put them together. So you would take two soldered links and then the unsoldered link uh, and open the unsoldered link just a little bit. Kind of the smallest amount you can to fit these both on there. I'm getting the sense of the value of jewelry, you know, like beyond much beyond the material itself, the amount of work that goes into right. creating beautiful pieces. We often joke that there's a reason jewelry is expensive and it's not just the gold. <laughs> All right. So I just closed that up. Now we have the start of a chain. So what would happen next is we would solder this right here. So this is also um, secured and Anna is actually going to show us that. So that'll be our last step in the chain making demo. And then we're going to switch gears to some stone setting with Joanna. So okay. we're going to head That's back great. to soldering right now. Thank you. Thank you so much. So soldering is one of the most fundamental skills that we learn as jewelers. And so soldering, what we call soldering in the jewelry business is actually brazing. The difference between soldering and brazing is temperature. I'm not gonna geek out too, too hard about that, but just to say that we're actually working at brazing temperatures here. So the first thing that we need to do for a successful soldering job is have a good setup. So good soldering requires three things, cleanliness, fit, and even heat. So this jump ring, you probably can't even see on camera, has a seam right here, and it is light tight. You can't see any light through that, there's no space. Because soldering is a process where we actually melt an alloy, and it flows into the crystalline structure of the material itself. So we have expansion under heat, we have this material that melts, and then it actually wicks the capillary action into that expanded crystalline structure. So it takes a fair amount of control to get this to happen. So get this set up. I have my two solder jump rings down here. I need to make sure that my solder seams are facing down and away, so I don't accidentally re-solder those and make a big, a big lump of jump rings. And then I'm fixturing this in a little heat proof pair of tweezers. This is what's called a third arm, and it's exactly that. It allows me to hold pieces so I can have two hands free 
for other tasks. Add that flux that Audrey was talking about earlier. Again, flux acts as a detergent and also keeps the surface clean. So this is part of that cleanliness piece of the equation in soldering. And now I'm going to go ahead and add the solder to the equation. So if you look down here, little chips, we call these kalians. And these are kalians of hard solder. So hard solder melts and flows at a very specific temperature. Actually, it's kind of temperature range. Um, and hard solder has the highest working temperatures of any of our solders. So we have hard solders, medium hard solders, medium solders, and easy solders. So this is, this is going to melt and flow at a relatively high temperature. Um, the calories that I'm using here are actually about two to three times larger than I need for the job. I just cut them really big so that folks could see what we were doing. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and get the torch lit. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier was even heat. So solder, while it responds to gravity, also responds to temperature. So I need to make sure that the temperature of this component is consistent on both sides of the seam. If it's hotter over here, the solder is going to flow towards heat. Hotter over here, the solder is going to flow towards heat. So I have to follow a really specific procedure to get this entire link to the correct temperature in order for the solder to flow. This is a little bit more complicated in highly conductive materials, and both copper and silver are highly conductive. So I'm going to use a technique called pick soldering. I'm going to introduce the solder into the equation with this pick. So the first thing I do is I melt my little pan and then I just pick it up. Start heating the tweezer. Because the tweezer is what we call a heat sink. It's actually sucking heat out of this equation. Sometimes gravity works against us. Watching my surfaces to give me a sense of when the solder is closed. So what you can see here is there's still a big old solder boot around there. But what I can see is the solder actually flowed into the sink, which is going to be absolutely impossible to see on camera. But what we're following in these situations is a series of visual cues. So our, the color of our metal, the surface of our flux, and then hopefully we can see the solder flow right now. So this is going to head to the pickle pot. I'm going to stop at the pickle pot on our way over to Joanna's bench, where she's going to take over and show us some cabbage on the stove setting. That's great. Thanks, Anne. And and uh, I just want to say thank you for uh, to our audience here. I'm, uh, I'm trying to do the best I can with uh, <laughs> with keeping things visual here. Joanna's right over here. Oh, great. Hi, Joanna. Hi, how are you? Good. <laughs> yes. Um, today I'm going to show you how we can like set a vessel. So there's a couple different ways we can set a vessel, like I said, we're doing camera setting today. Okay. Uh, and this is the piece that we're working on. Um, I have it fixtured and ready to set. And it doesn't look like much, but when it grows up, it's going to look like just a Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Um, so this is a variation on the first film setting project we do in the curriculum. Okay. Which is a split shank cabochon ring. Um, this is the one that I made. Um, and we've got a couple specific components that we're working with here. We have the bezel, which is actually surrounding the stone and holding it in place. We have the ornamental wire, which is just there to look pretty <laughs> and to surround the bezel. But then if I show you our split apart, one, you can see inside there, we have a little seat for our, bet, um, for our stone. Oh, cool. And the seat is just another jump ring that we make and we put in to, um, to give support to the stone so it doesn't break during the setting process. Um, and in this, um, in this scenario, what it also does is it raises the stone above the level of the ornamental wire so that I can actually get in to all of that metal and push it against the stone. So um, the other thing that we really care about among those components is the fit of our stone. 
into our vessel. Um, and the reason we care is actually seen in this pendant. You see how lopsided that is? Yes. <laughs> so I set this stone yesterday and I was so proud of myself. It was going so smooth. And then I stopped and I looked at it and I was like, oh no, what have I done? <laughs> <laughs> um, so what happened is my bezel was too big for my stone. So when I was pushing the bezel in, it kind of levered this part and it pushed up the other part, if that makes sense. So I like pushed it in and levered it up. I see, I see. Um, and I had to like come in this morning and I was like, oh my God, Anne, what did I do? <laughs> Um, and it's apparently a very common mistake, which makes me feel a lot better. Um, but this is why we need a good fit. <laughs> so, in case you ever wanted to know. So that's our bezel. And then the stone that we're using, um, it's the same one, same type of one as here. Um, it is a American Mind Amazonite, which is a feldspar. It has the most hardness of six to six and a half. Um, and it's in the same family as labradorite and moonstone. Okay. So it's got that same kind of like pearly shift to it that those tend to have. So that's our bezel, that's our stone. And then, like I said, we have our setup here. I have my little bezel fixtured into jet set. Okay. And we use basic jet set here. And what it is, is it's just plastic. It comes with these little beads. And so if you pour warm water, hot water on it, mm -hmm. it becomes malleable. And then what we're able to do is push it over, over our piece. And then oh. once it solidifies, then we have a secure thing that we can put to the vise to actually do our setting. Um, so it helps to protect our piece from the actual setting process. And in this curriculum, we also pre-polish all of our pieces so that if I do my setting right, um, It'll protect that polish, and then all I'll have to do is clean up my camera marks once I'm done with the actual setting. So, um, so then let me tell you the process, and then I'll show you how it actually works. Great. So what we're going to do, I wrote you a handy, handy little thing here. Thank you. You're welcome. So what we're going to do is we're going to tuck it in eight different spots. So north, south, east, west. Northeast, Southwest, Northwest, Southeast. Um, so we're going to tack it in those eight spots around the bottom, and that's going to hold the stone into place. Then we're going to go around um, with our hammer setting tool, do one roll, do one round around the bottom, um, and that's going to snug the stone um, into the bezel. Then we're going to do another round, which is going to start bringing the bezel down over the stone. Then we're going to do our final round around the top. And I realize I'm saying round a lot. I apologize. That's fair. <laughs> uh, and then that's going to finally bring the bezel down onto the stone. So you do this in stages. You start at the bottom and kind of secure this, then move up to the next layer, secure it, almost like it's not really a zipper, but but from bottom to yeah. top. Yeah. Yeah. We And we can't do one until we do the other. Okay. Like, I can't just jump into... Um, camera setting the middle part like without tacking it's just it's not going to work it's not going to be secure okay so it's very much all about the features um also a tip from me to you um don't try fitting your stone into your bezel too soon um because you will get your stone stuck yeah um, so i have set four different habitons in this program and i've gotten two of them stuck and i've had to drill out the back to push the stone out and that's really traumatic and I don't recommend it to anybody. Okay. So when your teacher tells you not to touch the bit of your stone, don't touch the bit of your stone. <laughs> so I'm just gonna come up with the slides right here. Okay, great. All right. Let me see here. I'm gonna do right here. And I'm gonna have to move a little bit. But yeah, that's that's fair. starts to round out mm -hmm. and the point where it breaks is where it's starting to kind of round out 
Okay. And what we have to do with our bezel is we have to come just above the point where it breaks so that we're holding it in. Because we can't, if we just have this straight square bezel, like it's not going to do anything. We have to bring it over that rounded point a little bit to like actually hold it down. So that makes sense? Yes, I'm following. Okay, thank you. All right. All right. So this is the hammer we're going to use. It's really thrilling. It's like, is she going to break the stone? Is she going to hit a finger? I've done all of them, so it's possible. Oh, good. <laughs> we are alive. We are alive. So this is my brass bezel pusher. Um, and like I said, I'm just going to tap the stone. You can also do the full setting process with the bezel pusher. Um, I honestly find hammer setting a lot easier um, because I feel like I have more control, which is very odd. It doesn't seem like it would be that way at all. But So I'm just going to go ahead and start tapping. Yeah, thank you for sharing your process here. You're welcome. Thank you for being along on the journey. So I just tapped it in those four spots. Now I'm going to come around and do another four. Okay. And this is all just human power. The metal is soft enough that you can tack it. Yeah, so you can push it in. I don't know if you can see that. We'll pick it up on camera. I can see it here. Yeah, I don't know. Little flat spots mm -hmm. from where I tacked it. And then we get to the fun part. All right. So this is my hammer setting tool. This is the one I'm going to use. Um, you can see it has a little flat face to it, um, which was pre polished. So that it won't leave any extra marks. Okay. Um, for a piece. So you polish the end of your tool. Yeah. Because your because it'll act as a stamp. Okay. So any scratches or anything that are on the end of our tool will stamp into uh, into the metal that we're. That makes sense. I'm gonna sidetrack you for a second. Where did you get these tools? Oh, I made these tools. You did? Yeah, not the hammer. Okay. Not the hammer. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I need these and my bezel pusher. Um, it's one of the first things we do when we start the program um, because we need to use the tool throughout the rest of the program. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just take um, ground stock and we cut it to length and then we do all the shaping to it and then we polish it. And then we use it to set stones or break them depending on the day. Very good. <laughs> so what we do, so for the first round, I'm just going to hold it flat to the end. And I'm going to tap and kind of move it as I tap. OK. Yeah, I'll switch with you. Okay, sounds good. And I can hear these changes in tone, and it makes me wonder, like, uh, you listening, you know, you kind of have a feel of, like, what is this sound? Oh my gosh. The first time I did a hammer setting, I was, like, tapping it barely, because mm -hmm. I was so scared. And Anne was in, like, the other part of the shop, and she came over, and she's like, I can hear what you're doing. You're never going to move the metal <laughs> <laughs> with that light of a pressure. And she was right, of course, because she's a teacher. And I mean that lovingly.
So that's our first round. Um, my stone is still moving, so I didn't do the greatest job. <laughs> that's okay, but it's not broken. It's not broken. I didn't break a finger. I didn't break a stone. And sometimes that's all you can ask for. So, so that's the process of how we set. Um, and then once we're done, I'm going to continue and finish setting it. Okay. Um, but once we do that, then you just have to go to our cleanup steps. And for that, we use our little pumice wheels. We have medium and fine pumice. Mm -hmm. These are just to remove the scratches left from the hammer marks. Um, and then we go over that with our red rouge compound, which is just iron oxide. It's just a pigment. Um, and I have a couple different little wheels to show you that I use. Um, and this just brings that shine back, makes it makes it all pretty. Um, and you have to choose your um, your abrasives and your polishing steps carefully, depending on the hardness of your stone. Okay. We're kind of skirting the line here because amazonite is six to six and a half on the move scale. Okay. And red rouge and pumice are in the same area, so it just means, so you have to be careful. Yeah. So it just means you have to like mask your stone while you're doing it. Okay. Um, but it's really the only thing you can use. So it's like, but we make it work. So good. Yeah. So that's how you hammer set. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, it's, it's wild to think, you know, you're polishing the end of your tool uh, to, to kind of not have any impact, but then you still know there's still going to be some. And this, so there's a whole process set up afterwards uh, to bring this to, you know, it's uh, as beautiful as it's going to be. So it's very cool. Thank you so much for sharing the, the process with us. Thank you for joining me for the process. Yeah. Are there any questions coming in? Uh, let me see. So if anybody's out there in our audience and you have any questions about jewelry making repair at North Bennett Street School, uh, about uh, the industry of being a bench jeweler, um, you're, you're welcome to. Uh, you're welcome to ask right now. Um, I'm always curious uh, because we are an accredited career school. Um, what what are the job prospects um, that are out there for bench jewelers? Can you talk about that a little bit, Anne? Absolutely. So um, the job prospects for North Carolina Street School of Trained Jeweler are excellent, and the options are really, really varied. Um, as a, for instance, Joanna is entering her fourth semester and she's actually starting her training and her internship over the next couple of weeks. So Joanna already has potential employment lined up and she hasn't even graduated yet. And the truth is that's not entirely uncommon. There's a huge demand for bench jewelers um, and they work in all kinds of different um, environments. So everything from uh, small wholesale manufacturers to bench jewelers in the back of a store, um, perhaps a more specific task in a larger production environment like stone setting. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our curriculum is actually over 50 projects. So we start with the basics of fabrication. We move into stone setting uh, in the first semester, basket stone setting in the second semester. So after their first year, students are prepared to enter uh, a number of different uh, arenas with basic skill set. Uh, by the time they're done with their second year, um, they're really prepared for employment in a lot of different, a lot of different environments. Um, so as I say, we have people working for large manufacturers, small manufacturers. Some students do aspire to self-employment. Uh, so we have students working entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially, excuse me, as designers. So the the, the opportunities are, are quite varied. That's great. And I, I feel like uh, jewelry making repair here at North Bennett Street School shares uh, with the rest of the programs here, we really require in so many ways that people have a focus uh, to work with precious metals, to want to do stone setting. At the same time, as you go through the curriculum, as you get experience, you may be introduced to something that maybe you, you weren't sure uh, that you had an interest in or that there's a job opportunity. I'm thinking of things like engraving or yep. so many other things. Yep. Can you Talk about people's process there. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you can be a generalist or you can be a specialist or you can be both in this industry. Um, it's very interesting. Historically, uh, a lot of shops were run with a jeweler, a setter, and a polisher. 
Um, so there were three people doing those three separate jobs. We don't see it as often anymore, but that certainly used to be the case. Um, and we introduced those three skills. Um, so all of our students have skill setting, fabricating, polishing. Um, we do introduce some more specialty things like engraving. Our engraving is very, very basic. We actually don't go into decorative engraving, but certainly decorative engraving is something that is uh, it's a niche. Um, it's actually a very profitable niche because there aren't a lot of hand engravers around anymore. Um, so certainly your training at North Bennett Street does start to touch on that. Um, same is true of stone setting. So I like to describe the, the curriculum as being circular rather than linear. Um, we start with very, very basic skills. So Joanna was talking about her stone setting tools. And there we're talking about measurement, we're talking about layout, we're talking about three-dimensional thinking as we reduce material using um, generally files. Um, from there, we move into uh, the addition of forming and soldering, et cetera, et cetera. So as we move through the program, the skills that we learned in those first projects and those first months are still at play in the last months of the curriculum. We're just honing our skill in those areas and introducing new concepts. So everything is, they're building blocks. Um, so you start here and your skills grow and grow and grow and grow, and you're always honing those initial skills throughout the entire process. That's great. Thank you, Anne. And a question came through uh, from our audience here um, where I think the question was, uh, if you have a fine arts background, um, how does that play into thinking of coming in this direction? So um, a number of our students have actually come to the program with a fine arts background. I'm included on that list. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my journey and what that meant for me and what it's meant for, for students. Um, so I uh, graduated from art school with a double major um, in metal smithing and jewelry and ceramics. And I knew that I wanted to focus on jewelry, um, got out into the world and realized very quickly that I had a really wonderful grounding in design, but I didn't have the grounding in technique. I did not know how to make the pieces that were occupying my brain. I just didn't have the skill. I didn't even, they didn't even know where to start. So I came to North Bennett Street after actually graduating from art school and working in the business for a little while because I knew that I needed more concrete skills to realize all of the things that were living in my head. And that's, a, that's an experience that a lot of our students coming from art school share. So a North Bennett Street School training is an opportunity to grow the technical skill set that allows you to execute the complicated designs that live in your brain. So that art background is, is helpful, but absolutely not required. Because um, North Bennett Street, first and foremost, is a technical training program. We're learning very, very specific, tangible skills in order to execute our work at the highest level. Thanks, Anne. And what, what are things that you look for in uh, candidates that you believe will be successful here in the program? Um, and out in the world as bench jewelers? That's a great question. Um, one of the things that is uh, really important is a little bit of patience um, and attention to detail. Now, both of those are things that frankly can be learned. I think all of my students, I'm gonna look around, can agree that they're starting to learn a little bit more patience and a little bit more attention to detail. Um, but uh, that, as, as a, that is a really excellent um, starting point. Um, what else? What else? I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask my students. What's important? What's important to be a successful student here at North Bennett Street? Patience is key, and the the persistence and knowing when to continue doing the same thing or have to change what you're doing. Um, I know I I didn't come here with any jewelry experience. I was a science teacher. Um, so those thinking to apply, um, it's more the desire and the seriousness in, in wanting to do it and wanting to spend the time um, and the energy and the hours upon hours upon hours of doing microscopic little movements to get it just right. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I'd say, I'd say one of the main things is the ability to stick with it. Um, for long periods of time, no matter what's kind of going on, you just kind of have to stick with it and work really hard through the problems. Um, and that takes a lot some days, um, but it's really, it's really nice to feel 
like you just had a long day, you worked hard the whole day, you were uh, attentive the whole day. I think it's really just a longevity thing. Uh, and it's really rewarding. Yeah. That's great. It kind of stole my thunder, but I was going to say dedication, um, but also the ability to remove yourself from your work. Um, I know I have a tendency, like all my self worth is wrapped up in my project. Um, and so if it's doing that, if it's not going well, then I'm a bad person. Um, and so one thing that Anne teaches here is observation, not judgment. So if we're looking at a ring that I'm making and my stone's loose, it doesn't mean I'm a bad person, it just means my stone is loose, you know? Um, and so that ability to, to start to remove yourself from your work just to the degree that it isn't infringing on your self-worth mm -hmm. is something I've definitely had to learn here. And, yeah. this, uh, it's a great point. And I feel like when, when you were, uh, showing us your demonstration, you know, even joking about, uh, you know, breaking the stone or something like that. <laughs> I can see, you know, your, um, your progression in this way. I feel like your comfort level. So, so, th so that's very nice. And, and I, I really appreciate our, our visit here today. And I hope that our audience, um, also, uh, had the ability to kind of visit us in a very safe way learn a lot about jewelry making and repair at North Venice Street School. It takes patience. It takes dedication. Uh, it takes so, so many cool things. A technical passion, I think. Um, and uh, the results are just amazing. Um, this is some of the highest quality work, I think, that's, that's done probably in the world. I'll go ahead and say that. Um, you're at least set up with a foundation to do that work uh, for a lifetime. And uh, I just want to say thank you so much um, for sharing with us. And um, for our audience tomorrow, uh, we'll be visiting a book binding followed by an information session. Uh, book binding is 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And we have an information session where you can learn about how to apply to jewelry making and repair. Uh, and our other eight programs, eight full-time accredited career training programs. Uh, we have financial aid and scholarship available. Uh, we have a start in this program on January 31st. Uh, we are taking applications for that start and into the foreseeable future. Uh, so if you want to join us or learn more about um, uh, thinking about joining us, uh, please join us tomorrow. Um, and again, thanks everybody. <laughs>